Hey everyone, uh, I'm Jonah Newman, like I said before, a uh, database reporter at the Chicago Reporter. I'm here with our data editor, Matt Kiefer, um, and we're talking about our recent project. Um, can I make my doc go away? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, shuttling for misconduct. So this is, um, here's just a, a quick preview. Um, so it's a database of the 655 so far. Um, Cases that the uh, police misconduct lawsuits that the city of Chicago paid out between 2012 and 2015. Um, and just like a very quick tour, you can um, scroll through. Um, and up here, there are different filters. Um, so you could look by neighborhood, say Auburn Gresham, um, see uh, how many cases paid out during that period in Auburn Gresham, um, and also various other filters and um, tag, so, you know, which ones included damage to property, um, and we'll see those. Um, and then, um, and we'll be talking about this a little later, also see which officers um, were named, um, and then uh, through those officer pages, see if they were named in any other lawsuits. So that's just a very, uh, very brief look at what the database does. Sorry, I'm going to go full screen here. Here we go. Um, so, how did it start? Who are we? Uh, the Chicago Reporter, for those of you who don't know, we are a, a nonprofit investigative news organization. We've been around since uh, the 1970s. Uh, our mission is to investigate issues of race, poverty, and income inequality. Um, and so, obviously, police misconduct is something that um, fits right um, in, inside our mission. But why, why police misconduct lawsuits? So um, often we're reporting and investigating issues um, from you know, racial or social justice lens. Um, we were interested in police misconduct lawsuits in particular because we felt like it's um, the place where police misconduct becomes not just a racial and social justice issue, but also a fiscal responsibility and accountability issue um, that really affects all Chicagoans because we're the ones who are paying for these lawsuits. Um, and we can talk more about that later. Um, so just a quick overview of what is a police misconduct lawsuit, how does it, uh, how does it come about? So um, if there's an incident of uh, alleged police abuse or police abuse, um, there's a few different routes. Obviously, um, uh, some of you probably heard uh, about the Invisible Institute's work looking at um, civilian complaints with the Independent Police Review Authority. So that's one route you can take. Um, and another route you can take if your civil rights have been violated by the police is filing a civil lawsuit um, in either state or federal court. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but as far as I understand, there's like a, about a two-year statute of limitations, um, give or take, but that also that starts when you've kind of discovered that you um, have been injured or your civil rights have been violated. So that might not be actually at the time of the incident. It could be, for example, in a wrongful conviction suit. Once you're uh, exonerated, that's, uh, you know, the two years kind of starts then. So anyway, um, it can be a very long process is kind of the, the point of that. Um, there's three ways that the lawsuits in our database go. Obviously, um, what's missing from here is uh, cases that are dismissed. And actually, about half of the cases filed against Chicago police um, are dismissed. So of the other half that um, are paid out in some way, um, they end in one of three ways. One, it goes to a jury, and a jury um, issues a, a verdict against the city. Uh, the second is that the case settles, and that's what happens to most cases. 85% uh, of the cases that pay out uh, are a settlement. And, and in that case, the city doesn't have to admit any liability. Um, they don't have to say the officers did anything wrong. They basically come to agreement and say, we'll pay you this much if you drop your lawsuit. Uh, and the third one is an offer of judgment, which is a legal um, kind of maneuver that, uh, in which the city says, okay, actually we do admit liability, um, and they also pay, um, pay the, the plaintiff in that case. Um, they then, uh, cases either go to the city council or um, are approved straight um, from the city's law department, which is the um, city's lawyers who defend these lawsuits. Um, if the Lawsuit uh, settles for $100,000 or more. It needs city council approval. Um, that's a small percentage, I think. Um, yeah, like one in five um, settle for more than $100,000. So most of these are um, pretty kind of small, relatively dollar, dollar amount cases. Um, and then they are posted on the law department website, which is where we uh, started. So here's the data that the law department puts out. I'm sorry, that's so blurry. Um, but it's a basic Excel spreadsheet with, with information about um, 
everyone who got paid um, from a, uh, a lawsuit against the city. They actually post not just police lawsuits, but all the other departments. So if you, um, you know, if your car gets hit by a um, city garbage truck, like, and you sue um, or file an insurance claim, those also go online. So we filtered out all the police lawsuits. We filtered out the ones specifically to, uh, related to misconduct. Um, and that's kind of where we started for our universe um, for, the, for the database. Um, then we had to, man, this is so much clearer on my computer. Um, so then we had to go to um, civil suit filings, um, either in federal court or state court, um, which you can't really tell what this looks like, but um, it's basically one giant PDF um, of text that's usually not uh, OCR'd. So, you know, we had to actually go through and read all of these complaints to get all the information about where did the incident happen, who did it happen to, um, who were the officers who were named, um, all this other kind of, all the basics. Um, so I was trying to highlight some of that. Where did it happen? Um, and then also more about kind of what exactly went on. Um, and we took that and then started to um, kind of categorize cases um, around different themes or different types of incidents. Um, from there, we actually used Google Forms to enter the data into a spreadsheet and start to build out uh, the tables that would ultimately uh, uh, power the database. Um, so we, and, and to be honest, it was an imperfect solution. I mean, it was nice because it's, um, we had a team of three researchers who I was working with who were doing all the data entry. Um, and so we were all able to obviously collaborate together, um, which is the nice thing about Google Docs. Um, there were like, we had to change the form at times and um, Google doesn't really like that because then it wants to change the output spreadsheet. So, you know, there were definitely um, downsides to, to going that route, but it, for the most part it worked, um, worked pretty well for us. Um, so we, like I said, there were like lots of different types of data points that we were trying to um, capture uh, from very unstructured data. So one was just those basic, where did the incident happen? Um, then we started to categorize it. So was the, were the victims, were they elderly? Were they minors? Were they um, you know, of a particular um, kind of uh, class? Were they Muslim? Were they uh, LGBTQ? So we were looking at um, that information. We also tried to capture, I mean, you can see this if you go to the, the settlements uh, database, but we also tried to capture kind of how did the incident start? Did it start in a traffic stop? Did it start um, with like a home invasion, like a warrant? Um, or you know, other kind of situations, um, what kind of misconduct. You can see bribery is the one, <laughs> one case that fit on the screen, but um, lots of other types of obviously misconduct, was it a shooting, et cetera. And then the other really important piece, I think, is we wanted to, um, we are a journalism organization and we're all about storytelling. And so we wanted to make sure that the stories of um, these incidents really uh, were kind of central to the database and to the user experience. Um, and so we actually wrote summaries of the kind of narrative summaries of each case. Um, and you'll see those also if you go into the database. Um, so then we started to build out um, a, a relational database. Uh, so we, like I said, we started with that payments data. This is a very uh, abridged uh, version of what this table is actually look like. But um, the payments data, which linked to the information we were entering about the cases which uh, linked to information that we were entering about police officers. So obviously, um, with an incident of police misconduct, there can be multiple officers named in a single incident. Often there are. Um, and also, obviously, um, one officer can be named in multiple incidents. So we had this many-to-many -many relationship um, that we had to deal with. And then um, we had to solve a problem, which uh, Matt's going to talk about in a minute, of um, what happens because these are, um, they're not, the data is dirty. Um, when when uh, lawyers enter it in, they misspell officers' names. Um, they put whatever information uh, they want. There's no kind of set uh, amount of information they have to put about an officer to name them in a lawsuit. So um, as you'll see here, this is just a, a small selection of cases. But um, here's this one guy, Armando Ugarte, um, who was named in a lot of lawsuits. Um, and, but you'll see, like, sometimes we had first and last names, sometimes we had badge numbers, sometimes we didn't, sometimes we only had last names. So um, the challenge for us was how do we take this data, and this isn't even the worst of it, sometimes there were misspelled names, sometimes there were badge numbers that were wrong. So how do we take that data 
um, and make sure that we, for every officer, we know actually who the officer is and also if their name's in other complaints. And so that's what Matt's going to talk about. Yeah, so you could imagine um, like the challenge here. I think when a lot of journalists typically we look at uh, inconsistent data, we try to make it consistent. Like people use tools like Google Refine, which wouldn't work for us for a variety of reasons, not least of which is uh, we wanted better auditing when we decided that, okay, this officer is actually this uh, person. Uh, we wanted to have that. Um, sort of more like a link than actually changing the original source data, uh, which is uh, good practice. So uh, what we were able to do is get from CPD a list of all sworn officers going back uh, a while, like as far as we needed, like mid 20th century. And uh, we had first name, last name, all their badge numbers up to like some of them had as many as 10 uh, during their career. Um, we had their dates of service and some other miscellaneous. Uh, and what we were able to do is the solution essentially was to take the case cop record, which is a specific officer named in a specific case, and we know the case that they're in, that's an easy enough um, relationship to establish. But then we uh, wanted to figure out exactly which officer it was in our, in our cops table, um, using things like first name, last name, middle initial if we had it, badge number. Um, and dates. So the goal with, I think we had about 2,900 something like that case caps. Um, we couldn't do that manually. Um, so the goal was to automate as much as possible, but also to audit everything that we did so we could go back and double check everything. And, um, you know, those are the basic goals here. Um, I think we had 85% uh, of the um, matches automated, so we only have to do 15%, um, which was great. And so I'll just kind of walk through the logic a little bit, um, but just to step back as far as like the um, technical stack, we're basically just using um, vanilla Django, which is just Python talking to a database. Um, so we had our data models, which you know resemble the tables uh, that you saw. We also had some. Um, class methods that would basically come up with, uh, for a given case cop, it would select uh, all of the cops that matched on last name, all the cops that last matched on first name, um, badge number, et cetera. And it would sort of return a dictionary that had all of that, and we'd distill that down to a set of cops that were common to our uh, specific criteria, the logic here basically being, you know, it should hit on the last name or, um, the first name or badge number, combination of those, and then also we should do a sanity check and make sure that they're actually on the force at the time of the incident, like they didn't retire before or appointed after uh, the incident itself. And if we got one and only one result, then we, uh, may, we established that relationship. We linked the case cop to the officer uh, who was identified. Um, and so that's important from an accountability aspect. Um, as Jonah pointed out, there are some officers uh, named in several cases, um, so we're able to tabulate in the application um, like the total amount of payments um, related to cases that that officer was named in. And so that was the significance of establishing that relationship. Um, but we still had that 15%, so we had to do those manually. Um, and one of the best ways uh, we got most of these knocked out was to build a web interface where um, Jordan was able to go through and using a list of candidates that we have, you know, sort of down here, um, qualified candidates, basically the match on, you know, last name or badge number. Um, and so we had like a multiple choice and he's able to do a little bit of extra research, you know, figure out their rank and their um, depart, uh, the uh, unit that they were assigned to. And we were able to figure out exactly who those, you know, remaining uh, police officers were, and I think we got north of, got around 99% eventually uh, matched. Um, so what we learned, I'll let Jonah take the first part of this. Cool. So um, what did we learn about police misconduct um, in Chicago? Um, a few things. So um, 
once we had matched up all the cops, um, and again, keep in mind, we're looking at a fairly small window. Obviously, police misconduct has been happening for uh, much longer than the last four years in Chicago. Um, that was kind of a, we're a very small outlet, um, and we had some uh, great grant, grant funding for this, so we were able to hire on a, a few more people uh, temporarily to help, help us do the work, but four years was kind of a reasonable time frame that we were able to, to look at, and, and thought would be enough to start to look for patterns and trends. Um, so, but within those four years, um, there's a relatively small number of officers who are named in multiple um, lawsuits. So we found like 1,600 officers named in any lawsuit uh, over that period. Chicago Police Department has about 12,000, 12,500 uh, active officers. Of course, some of the officers in the complaints um, are no longer on the force. So um, we're looking at around 10 to 12 percent of officers named in any lawsuit over that period. Um, of those, there were only 71 who were named in three or more lawsuits. So that gives you a sense of how few officers are really responsible for um, an outsized number of, of these complaints. Um, but there are definitely patterns that we found that kind of transcend just individual officers. Um, so just a few of those. Um, and keeping in mind that the um, lawsuits, again, because most of them settle. In most cases, the city is not admitting liability. So these are still sort of allegations um, of misconduct. They're not proven uh, incidents of misconduct. But um, about half of them uh, said that officers lied or filed false reports um, and that that uh, led to someone's false arrest, usually, or, um, or other misconduct. Um, about a third of the lawsuits alleged that some of the officers on the scene that could have helped to prevent the misconduct didn't. Um, and about a quarter of the excessive force lawsuits, which that's a, a subset of all the lawsuits, um, the person who was um, allegedly um, abused or uh, the victim of excessive force was also then charged with either resisting arrest or assault of a police officer. Um, so those were a few trends that popped out to us, um, patterns that we thought, hmm, maybe there's something um, going on here, kind of policy-wise or training-wise, um, that might be worth um, looking into. Um, and the last thing we learned is that the city doesn't actually do that. Um, so uh, that may not come as a surprise, um, but the city doesn't uh, systematically look for patterns of uh, misconduct in lawsuits. Um, they technically do um, through civilian complaints, but like I said earlier, um, not everyone files a complaint with IPRA. Um, some people just don't trust IPRA uh, to actually investigate their complaints. So they figure um, a lawsuit's a better path because at least maybe I'll, I'll get some um, financial compensation. So um, those were kind of the, the big picture um, takeaways from our, uh, our investigation. Um, so some of the technical lessons that we learned, um, schema changes, everybody hates those. Like it just happens though in, in, um, in, in database projects. Uh, Jonah had a good idea for, you know, next time we do data entry, which would be to do a sample of some of the data entry, make sure it's working out, you know, and then you don't go too far down the road and you can, you know, decide if you need to make any changes at that point. Um, I found that particularly annoying, I guess, with Django, and it was kind of my first time using like migrations, and I don't know if other people have similar uh, experiences, but redoing those um, was kind of a pain. I found it was just better to just, well, for the next project, I started doing that stuff manually, but um, I feel like in journalism, it's really important to drop your database every time when you're going to reload and just reload fresh and, you know, just to kind of have good data hygiene. I felt that migrations kind of got in the way of that. Um, so that's it for technical uh, things. I um, would like to announce uh, tonight here at Chi Hack Night that the Chicago Reporter uh, is on GitHub. So uh, we're sharing and we're happy to. <laughs> thank you. We're happy to um, talk a little bit about how the Cop Matcher worked. That's pretty much what we're sharing. Um, not the uh, design for the front end application, which uh, real quick shout out to INN, Independent News Network, um, for putting that together for us. Uh, so what we're sharing is what we talked about in the middle here with that uh, cop matcher identifier thing. Um, here's the link to the database itself and our website. So I think that takes us to questions. Yeah, go ahead. Do you, uh, this is kind of specific, but are you familiar with Hellman Square? OK. With, with this data, would I be able to sit down and potentially, if there was another site like Homan, 
you think that this could surface in data like this? Um, it could. We didn't find it. If you do, I mean, if Did you, you look though, that. Um, I mean, we we definitely looked for patterns by location um, and didn't didn't find anything um, anything that like kind of replicates home and square or I mean again a lot of these because these um, because lawsuits have kind of a long lifespan um, there were lots of lawsuits still that were being paid out in the last four years related to uh, Burge torture um, from decades ago so. That's the other thing about lawsuits is they tend to have a kind of a long uh, life. The, one of the police experts I talked to is like, um, they're, they're definitely not a good early intervention system because by the time a lawsuit's been paid out, you're way past early intervention. Um, so I'm not sure that it would really be that useful for finding, but it's yeah. definitely possible. Yeah. We do have a tag for legal access denied. We have 18 cases, so that would maybe be a place to kind of start um, that's a good question. So some of those 71 police officers uh, have been fired, but not that many of them. Like that Ugarte guy who I pointed out is still on the force, as far as I know. Um, and he's named in like eight or nine lawsuits. So a lot of money. Um, I mean, like I said, the vast majority of these cases are, are not the kind of big... Um, uh, like million dollar cases that m kind of make the headlines. Um, so, but it does build up over time for sure. Um, and, and definitely, I mean, the officers who were, who kind of, who have cost the city the most, many of them are either uh, Burge related and they are not on the force anymore, um, or were part of the special operations section, um, which was another notorious um, Chicago Police Department unit that, um, uh, ended up all being federally indicted, uh, mostly, not, mo not all, most of them were feder federally indicted for shaking down drug dealers and um, anyway, so a lot of them actually have been fired, the ones who really have, um, have cost the city the most in this period, but definitely not all of them. That's a good question. Well, yeah. Are there any groups doing a similar product of um, instances of misconduct by employees in correctional facilities? Um, Prisons, that's a great question. Not that I know of. Um, certainly some of that overlaps. Like there were, um, and we actually, this was kind of an editorial decision we made early on, was that um, we were focused on Chicago police. And so even in, in some cases that mention misconduct at the hands of police officers and then further misconduct um, once they got to Cook County Jail or the Illinois Department of Corrections, um, we did not include those, um, those correctional officers in our database. So. Um, we actually kind of specifically excluded it just because it, uh, it was a little bit outside our scope, but um, not that I know of, but I think that would be really interesting because those definitely happen. Do it. It's <laughs> a good idea. So could you say a little something about why it's exciting that you all are up on GitHub now? Like what, what does that mean for your organization? And then how do you all make editorial decisions? Like how do you work with... I mean, I, I think you all both are reporters, but have you worked with kind of domain experts and other reporters, any non-technical folks that you might work with? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. The first part of the question, uh, well, why GitHub? Because we feel it's important to you know, show our work, um, to be uh, transparent and accountable about the work that, that we do, uh, as well as to assist other journalists who are you know, pursuing similar or, you know, maybe not even similar endeavors. The cop matcher could be used to, you know, match other people uh, whenever you have, like, uncertainty or ambiguity about, like, who an individual is. I mean, it's like first name, last name, and sort of like ID, badge number field. So you could kind of just crib off of that to, you know, do something similar. Um, the second part of your question was what again? So are you all reporters who are also um, database developers, or how do you also work with some reporters that are not? Like, how do you handle editorial decisions and kind of getting the story side of things? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so we're a super small staff. We're recently kind of grown a little bit, but we're still like uh, basically four reporters, um, and we've got a data editor and a social media editor and a couple other editors. So we're um, we're we're super small. So um, I was the lead reporter, and um, working with our um, editor in chief, 
um, to kind of make those editorial decisions about, you know, what's our scope. But, you know, we had decided at one point um, to also exclude um, car crashes that uh, r resulted in um, injury or death. Um, not that that's not horrible, um, but we were we decided we wanted to focus on things that were um, kind of more intentional misconduct, and you could kind of argue that uh, a car accident could happen to any uh, city employee. So, you know, we, we made those decisions along the road. Um, some of them maybe I would have changed. Some of them, you know, I think were the right call. But. Yeah. I had a question about, um, has there any of your findings or patterns uh, yet to evoke a response from the city? Like, for instance, getting so much dirty data in, and, you know, you take that to the city, like, your data entry is horrible, you know? Do something about um, unfortunately, no. We have not gotten much of a response from the city. And actually, a couple of weeks after our story came out, the Inspector General, unrelated, came out with an um, advisory about the fact that the city doesn't uh, analyze claims, not just police <laughs> misconduct, but all kinds of claims for patterns. Um, and the city basically went, um, and uh, particularly actually with police misconduct said, um, we're going to start to look at all those other ones, but uh, because of this Department of Justice investigation, uh, we're not going to look at those police ones because they might tell us not to. I, I'm not really sure. Um, so anyway, so we, they have, we have not gotten much of a positive response from them. So anyway. Yeah, we're here. Did you look at um, parsing the data, I guess, like in another way rather than having human beings read it? Uh, you know, like, like out from. That's a really scary thought. I mean, just co I mean, it, I think it could be done, and I think I think it 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 could be done sensibly if, like, you know, are you talking about like um, nat natural language, um, you know, sort of analysis? So, I think it could be done, but we would have to read it anyway to double check it. Um, but yeah, that would that would be that sounds that sounds really cool, and I think that if you could do it in a way where you just were able to double check it manually, that that would be an interesting solution. But we don't have uh, we didn't have the uh, apparatus for that. Yeah. I also just to add like some of the way like these are legal documents, and so they're written in legalese, and like sometimes it was hard even for humans to read it. So like not to say that. That makes it harder or easier for a computer to read it. Maybe, maybe easier, but um, but certainly, like it took sometimes several reads by several people um, to make sure that even we were capturing exactly what happened. And like, so. Okay, Eric. Yes. <laughs> what does it mean? <coughs> what does it mean when an officer is in a lawsuit? I mean, is it does it mean that they're being accused of a specific? act of wrongdoing or does it mean something else? So that, that's a great question that we, um, we had to grapple with, especially at the end when we brought in some lawyers who were like, uh, are you sure about this? Um, but so I think what you're asking is like, if an officer is named in a lawsuit, doesn't necessarily mean that they either did the things or are accused of the things and um, that are kind of alleged in the lawsuit. And, and the answer is not necessarily, right? Sometimes. Um, a lawyer will name all of the officers who were on the scene that night, um, and maybe some of them are called out specifically for doing specific things, and some of them are just sort of part of the group of officers that were there and are, um, you know, called out for being there and not stopping it, um, which actually also is a civil rights violation. So, um, you know, I think, but it does get murky, and in some cases, lawyers um, are maybe purposely vague, and so they just talk about officers did this and officers did that. So it's hard to tell exactly who did what. Um, so we try to be as clear, especially in the uh, narrative kind of case summaries as possible about which officer was um, you know, alleged to have done which specific acts. Um, but sometimes it wasn't possible. Yeah. So I saw a lot of hands in the back and Jonah and I will stick around to talk. Anyone has any more questions? Cool, thank you so much. Thanks a lot everyone.